Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the National Tsunami podcast. This week, we are offering four conversations around the general topic of COVID-19 and fatty liver disease. This conversation goes back to the question that started our podcast 90 episodes ago. What impact is COVID-19 having on clinical trials for NASH, NAFLD, and other liver diseases? And how might the Delta variant come to affect this? The answers might surprise you with both good news and bad news rolled into one series of comments. Finally, the four panelists each offer one key takeaway they would like the listener to leave this episode with. Again, opinions vary widely. This episode covered 10 separate topics in 50 minutes, so the conversation moves quickly and energetically. Don't miss a word, but just sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the discussion on our LinkedIn and Facebook discussion groups. Roger Green. The one other issue I want to get to before we ring out today, this podcast started looking at a very specific question, which is COVID-19 and clinical trials. So, Stephen, I guess the question is, have the adaptations that the system made be adequate to deal with what Delta and possibly subsequent variants are throwing at us? Or are we seeing an emergence of a new set of challenges around that? And if so, uh, how do we deal with that going forward? Stephen Harrison. Yeah, you know, I think we, we, we've gotten pretty facile at, at working around COVID relative to clinical trials. It's not to say we don't still have issues. I think the biggest issue really is in getting patients to come forward for screening and doing all the study-related procedures that are required. Just today, for instance, we had a patient that was very skeptical about moving forward with his MRI and his liver biopsy because of the Delta variant surge, despite having been vaccinated. So it's still an issue. Well, we've been able to manage through that issue, albeit at a, at a slightly slower pace. Our screening numbers are still down from pre-COVID and our randomization numbers are down from pre-COVID. But shops are able to remain operational and open, generally speaking, and NASH trials are being able to be accomplished, albeit still at a slightly slower pace. What has Paradoxically, I think one of the benefits of this pandemic has been working with sponsors and CROs to find ways, unique ways, novel ways to to bring healthcare delivery to the home in the form of portable phlebotomy, drug delivery, even telehealth visits over over the phone relative to safety checks, adverse event assessments, etc. So we are using this pandemic or, or as a result of the pandemic, we're making great strides in how we do clinical trials and how we deliver health care that I think will be far reaching well beyond the resolution of this pandemic. So in a way, it is spearheaded, it is galvanized, use the whatever word you want to use to basically fast forward our development, if you will, of health care delivery to patients to make it easier for them to get what they need and to get it in a safe and effective way. So I I'm excited about where we're headed, and I would say that we're still able to do what we need to do, albeit at a slightly slower pace. Donna Cryer. I think advances certainly in blood-based or serum-based screening for NASH really helps think through what it would really take to do a fully decentralized or, or home trial in NASH. And as we take the time to, to look at each element of a trial in NASH and, and figure out, is it essential to get us the valuable data in a way that's that's feasible for the patient and the physician, this has brought on some really great new opportunities, accelerated a lot of technology that patients have wanted to have integrated into the research setting for a while. And it is really exciting. And as we think about how we can scale up NASH research and meet sort of my personal ambition to fill up every NASH trial, I think it really will have to be this decentralized or at least a hybrid trial model so that it, it you know, more patients can participate. The other thing that, that I'll say parenthetically is one of the organizations that we've found and have been able to work very closely with is one called the Healthy Truckers Association. I didn't know that organization existed, but ever since we've been working with them and I'm driving up and down Interstate 35 between San Antonio and Dallas, I'm struck by the sheer numbers of trucks that are on the road. All it takes is one car wreck and you see the huge pile up on three lanes on the interstate and you can't see 10 feet in front of you without hitting a semi. I mean, they're everywhere. And the nice thing about developing applications for clinical trials that can be portable and delivered to the patient is that we're able to access organizations such as the Healthy Truckers Association to really deliver healthcare in a 
portable setting, whether you're in Washington, D.C. today or Omaha, Nebraska tomorrow or L.A. in three days, uh, doesn't mean you can't have your appointment. And, and I think that's that's some of the advances that, that we're making. And, and this pandemic has supercharged those developments. So that's great. I'm going to ask you a couple of rather specific questions that we were asking at the beginning of the pandemic 18 months ago when we started this podcast, things people wanted to know, right? The question then was, how much will things slow down? And the answer was a lot. And we had a couple of estimates of what that meant. Is this pandemic, are we well enough equipped that we will stay at the same rate we are now, albeit a slower rate than it used to be two years ago? Or will the effect of Delta and subsequent variants be maybe to slow things down a little more, not derail them, but slow them further? Would you guess? In NASH study? Yeah. No, we'll be back. We'll, we'll be back faster. We'll be, we'll be, as soon as we can get past this pandemic, uh, if, if that's such a thing, the tools, the equipment, the technology that is being generated during this pandemic time will allow us to take huge strides forward in streamlining the process and making healthcare delivery more efficient and effective and safe for patients. I and believe that's be, absolutely right. Totally agree. And there's a pent up demand for research that we've certainly helped create and an importance and some resources and tools about what it's like to participate in a national clinical trial and how important that is and, and integrating that into the messaging and the workflow for primary care and other other physicians. And so we're using this time wisely, all of us across the research enterprise, advocacy included, and we will be really in a great place to, to jumpstart research when it's a little safer, even more than now. Excellent. So let me be a pain in the neck and do the devil's advocate version of the question one more time, and then we're good. I understand the aftermath and all the benefits of that. But Stephen, if Delta got us up to a couple hundred thousand cases a day in the U.S., big jump over even where we are now. During the period we were managing that wave, would it affect the timing of trials or are you guys solid enough now that the timing will hold where it is and then improve later, do you think? I think any more surge in, in the Delta variant we will, will have a, a big impact on our enrollment timelines. They've been mitigated slightly, but I still think we're able to predict enrollment completion for many studies based on current screening and randomization paradigms. Mm -hmm. If that worsens to any significant degree, we're going to see that impact clinical trials research. Right now, it's very calculated. We know what we're dealing with. We know we know what to expect. But but again, I think that's a, still a, a bit of a fluid situation. And I understand the point that you made, which I don't think people are thinking about, and no, certainly in financial community, which is if you get this in the rearview mirror, things will go faster. And I, I, because, yes, that's correct. Absolutely. So I think both those points are important. The fluidity now has an upside and a downside both, which I think is important to note. All right. With that, anybody have any questions or we should, we're, we're, this has been a, an excellent and long session in part because of the 20 minutes of kibitzing up front in part because of the topic. Um, should we go to final question? Anybody have we just don't want to let Donna go, okay? And so we've drug it out a little bit longer than normal. <laughs> and we're going to see if we can make it last another hour because we just don't, we, we're not good at saying goodbye. Stephen, she's on the hook to come back once a month unless we scare well, her off. So um, <laughs> you, you, you haven't scared me, uh, but you also haven't made me burn my, my roast chicken. <laughs> Did we have her a hello? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So final question. What should our listeners take away from this conversation about the part of the pandemic that touches you? Don, the patients, Louise, kind of what we're seeing in the UK, Stephen, treatment or clinical trial, take your pick. Go ahead. Yeah. So I would say that the last message is that NASH patients are more vulnerable to risk of COVID, you know, severe effects of COVID and need to be prioritized for vaccination and need to really understand uh, their individualized response. And so we're working on that. I, I think it will lead to additional research in the immunocompromising effect of having a liver disease, and all which was something not at all on anybody's radar screen before this, I think. Mm -hmm. Louise Campbell. I'm going to just fully agree with Donna on all those points. And I think also using science to help protect you against all illnesses. Liver patients are susceptible at, at a greater risk to all of these viral illnesses. We're discovering more liver patients throughout the pandemic because more liver patients are being affected. So again, the early diagnosis of people with liver disease, undiagnosed fatty liver disease, undiagnosed NASH needs to continue a pace that Donna and that lead. If you can be protected for 
COVID, be vaccinated, but also for the flu vaccine as well. Even if we don't get a, a bad flu season, you've protected yourself as much as you can possibly. And we, and we are vaccinating relatives of those who are immunocompromised, again, to protect those who are immunocompromised here. And they're given a fast timeline to do that. So keep going. Well, I'm just going to end with, with a quote. If the vaccine isn't given, life may not be worth living. Ooh, that's a great Ooh. setup for a Luke Bryan concert. <laughs> I know. <don't even. laughs> Ooh. I was trying to find something like, if the glove doesn't fit, you must have quit. Yeah, you know? I, think, yeah I think you did. <laughs> no, no, I think you are yeah, perfect. Donna, I think we're talking bumper sticker here from GLO. No, I'm, I'm, making a, I'm making a T-shirt, you know, right okay. now. All right. So here, here's mine. All right. People who would like to be educated about all the complexities of science and think about their own health and the health of those they love in that context. This has been a fantastic experience. Not the podcast, but the entire event with a lot of cost attached to it. The challenge, I think, in the States and to a lesser degree in other countries is going to be whether we can cut through clutter surrounding the politicization of science. I'd like to think that that will happen over time, but it's going to be a challenge. And one, frankly, we've kind of got to get right eventually, or else we're going to lose a lot more people and we're going to lose them in, in, in ways that we, we would rather not. So on that not particularly upbeat note, let me thank Donna for coming back and staying a half hour past expected and showing up early so we could give it in advance. And Louise and Stephen as well. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We will be back next Wednesday, September 8th, with a series of individual interviews with patient advocates and some key opinion leaders discussing what each considers the most important story from the summer. Given some of the recent news and major academic publications and government actions, this should be fascinating to hear. I hope you'll join us. Until then, stay safe, surf on, see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.